C9 in some ways seems a bit less dramatic than the scene which follows it. Um, and, and in some ways you could, you could almost question, well, why does Williams put this scene in um, if scene 10 seems to do all of the same stuff, you know? Scene 9 is Mitch kind of um, making a move on Blanche, attempting to, to sort of rape her and, and, and this relationship coming to an end, which seems a lot less dramatic than, than, than when Stanley actually does rape her. But this seems to be the scene for me where Blanche is forced into the literal world of, of, of New Orleans. Um, and ironically alongside that, Williams is actually uh, dragging us as an audience out of that world and, and to see things um, as Blanche has seen them. So it's those two, two conflicting ways of seeing the world again, which I think is clear. Um, in the opening stage direction on page 83, we get this, you know, Williams specifically states the music is in her mind, she's drinking to escape it. So just that, that you know, that, that reminder really that this music that we've heard is the music in Blanche's head. We're hearing what is in Blanche's head. And throughout this scene, Williams takes us into Blanche's head. So at the moment that Mitch is attempting to expose her lies and show us the reality, the audience actually is going into Blanche's head and understanding the way that she sees the world. So there's a real sort of irony there. Um, Mitch enters top of page 84, Blanche says, well, you haven't even shaved the unforgivable insult to a lady. Um, so again, we see how this idea of, of, of Southern gentility and, and the perfect gentleman of the South is, is, is not met in Mitch at all. You know, Blanche's idea that a man should be both um, sexually attractive and, and romantically interested in a woman, um, but also have all these gentlemen qualities, again, is undermined. And, William seems to be showing how in New Orleans men are forced one way or the other, they're either infantilised like Mitch is sort of earlier on, um, or they become predators, which is what Mitch is trying to be here. Um, Blanche hears the, the, the music there and the, the, the polka music and the top of page 85 she says, there now the shot, it always stops after that. So again, Williams is taking us into Blanche's head, reminding us of Alan Gray alongside this moment where Mitch is also turning out to be very disappointing for very different reasons. But again, Williams' point seems to be that they either end up um, seen as uh, being sort of other, you know, Alan, Alan Gray as, as, as a gay man is, is seen as being uh, diseased in some way or deficient in some way. Or they end up conforming like, like Mitch does. Um, halfway down page 85, Blanche says, take the, your foot off the bed, it has a light cover on it. Of course you boys don't notice things like that. So again, it, it's Blanche's attempt to sort of um, achieve domestic bliss in the heart of New Orleans that is ruined and intruded upon uh, by Mitch being this, this, this uh, fake, um, you know, this fake gentleman, this, this figure who actually is in this scene trying to be much more like Stanley. Mitch says towards the top of page 86, I don't think i ever seen you uh, in the light. Um, and essentially, you know, this sets up him exposing Blanche and, and holding her face under this harsh light bulb, which represents the new world, you know, the electricity, the bright light to New Orleans that Blanche can't handle, you know, both because they literally reveal her age, but also because um, they expose her way of seeing the world um, and don't allow the sort of the romance of the candles that, that, that Blanche likes. Um, Mitch kind of a, a explains as he tears the paper lantern off the light bulb, shuts as a frightened gasp, so that, you know, that lantern very much represents Blanche. It's, she's being exposed to the real world in the same way that the lantern is being ripped off. Um, and Blanche says towards the bottom of page 86, I don't want realism. And she says, I try to give that to people. I misrepresent things to them. I don't tell the truth. I tell what ought to be the truth. And by this point, I think Williams is, is making that very clear to the audience. This is Blanche being very, very sincere. Suddenly Blanche isn't a liar, Blanche is someone who is doing exactly what Williams does with his lighting, with his sound effects, um, with his use of costume, he's doing what Blanche does. He misrepresents, he, he shows the world as it ought to be, he shows a more poetic version of the world, which is exactly what Blanche has done. So Williams really allies himself with, with Blanche here, and Mitch is exposed really as someone who, who doesn't understand theatre, who doesn't understand the message. And if the audience want to understand this, we've, we've got to be disagreeing with, with Mitch. Um, which I think is what makes this scene uh, particularly sort of clever. Mitch Harford on page 87 talks about how three people basically uh, swore to the fact that, that Blanche was, was, was seen in this uh, bar of ill repute. Blanche replies with rubber dub dub, three men in a tub and such a filthy tub. Um, you know, on the one hand, this is a, a loss of a uh, loss of a grip on reality. But with that mention of the tub and the filthy tub, we're reminded of all that bathing imagery. Partly, I think, because this is undermined here, you know, Blanche's purity clearly um, hasn't been allowed to, to sort of go ahead. Um, but also, I think, to, to set up this, this water fire imagery that carries on throughout the scene as well. Um, just like when Blanche rolled her eyes in scene six, it's with Mitch here that she seems to be at her most self-aware. 
we get it towards the bottom of page 87, she says it wasn't the flamingo, um, it was the tarantula. Um, and she says, yeah, big spider, that's where I brought my victims. Um, I had many intimacies with strangers. She opens up and, and, and tells the truth. But also she represents herself as this spider figure, you know, pulling these men towards her on, on this web. There's a real self-awareness here of how Blanche is, is seen by other people. Um, you know, and actually not only is she only up, she's almost undermining the whole uh, double standards that, that sees Blanche as this um, predator almost, when actually throughout the plates it's very much been Stanley and now Mitch who are set up in, in that way. So again, when Blanche is actually revealing the truth, the audience has to sort of side with her and has to side with her way of seeing the world. So it's a very harsh truth that comes out on page 87. Um, but through doing that, ironically, Williams is forcing us to, to see the world as, as Blanche sees it, rather than accepting the harsh truth that is what Mitch um, appears to want. Uh, towards the top of page 88, um, Blanche says, I thank God for you because you seem to be gentle, a cleft in the rock of the world that I could hide in. The poor man's paradise is a little peace. So that understanding again, the poor man's paradise, you know, Blanche's awareness that um, Mitch was never the, the ideal man, but what he was, was, was gentle, that she was looking for in Mitch exactly what she was looking for in Alan Gray. In both cases, it was thwarted. But William shows him in a forced into one extreme or the other. With Alan Gray, it was thwarted because he couldn't live up to Blanche's ideals of a man through being gay. Mitch can't live up to those ideals, uh, A, because I guess he's not uh, refined and, and um, to put it bluntly, educated enough, I guess, to see the world as Blanche does, but also because he ends up conforming to the type of, of, of Stanley. Um, Blanche took a bit towards the halfway point of 88, says, never inside, I didn't lie in my heart. And again, you know, Williams is really stressing that point that there's a difference between lying and misrepresenting. Williams is not lying in his heart, is you know, he's presenting a play that isn't realistic totally, um, but does tell a deeper truth. We get the vendor coming in around the corner then, as if to emphasise this, Williams then uses staging and shows this blind Mexican woman outside. So at the moment when Blanche is saying, no, you know, I told you the truth in my heart, Williams then gives us an image that doesn't feel entirely um, realistic, the shadowy figure of the woman selling flowers to the dead, for the dead, it's very symbolic. Um, and again, he's alloying himself with Blanche. He's doing what, what Blanche does. He forces us to kind of see Blanche's point of view. And um, the polka tune fades in lower down on page 88. So again, we are hearing and seeing the world as Blanche hears and sees it. We get towards the bottom of page 88, Blanche lapsing into this, um, I guess, borderline insanity that carries on throughout the play. Towards the bottom of page 88, she says, legacies hurt and other things such as bloodstained pillow slips. Her linen needs changing, yes, mother, but couldn't we get a coloured girl to do it? So it's references to the, to the uh, I guess, um, indirectly to the slave trade and to, to black servants, to the racial inequality of the South, which presents Blanche as very, very outdated. But then Williams has always done that, you know, right from the start of the play, when she's shocked at meeting a, a black woman when she first enters New Orleans. Um, but alongside that, notice the linen changing, the, the bloodstained pillow slips. You could argue... It's a sign of tainting, like the Coca-Cola on the white dress. You could also link it perhaps with, with menstrual blood. You know, is, is, is that where the blood stains have come from? So it's Blanche, you know, forcing to, being forced to, to leave her innocence behind. So at this moment that she does utter this um, reminder that she's from a, a, a different world and a world that the audience don't necessarily like very much, we also get this understanding that Blanche has been um, forced to, to grow up, forced to change and has lost a, a, a lot of innocence there. It's very different to the image of a slightly racist Blanche that we get at the start of the play. Um, we get the reference towards the top of page 89 about Blanche um, having relationships with, with some of the, the young men who, who were, were soldiers but who would, would basically um, get drunk. Um, she says later the paddy wagon will gather them up like daisies the long way home. So these men you know, falling uh, asleep, basically passing out through drink. Kind of seems to be linked to me um, to the deaths that are coming as well. You know, as soldiers, they're, they're, they're lying on the floor and being collected up. Um, so again, it's it's this um, death of male innocence that we're seeing, aren't we? Um, you know, these young soldiers who it's being forced out of them, um, and still, you know, ending with the the baby in the blue blanket. That seems to be a bit of a cycle that's continuing, and in an ironic way, at least Blanche is, is out of this. Um, Mitch then makes a move on Blanche and basically says, you know, that, that he wants to have sex with her. Um, he doesn't want to marry her, but he, he just wants her for, for her body. Um, and, and Mitch says towards the bottom of page 89, you're not clean enough to bring in the house with my mother. So there's that filthy tub image again, you know, Blanche not being clean. You know, throughout the play we've had the idea of her trying to be pure. 
and it's set up here, you know, that she's seen as fundamentally tainted um, in this world. It's only through Williams's interpretation through the theatre that, that we actually see her as quite clean and see her ascension at the end as some kind of angelic figure almost. She shouts fire, fire, fire at the end of this scene. We've had the fire imagery throughout the, throughout the play. Stella walks down the fire escape um, steps. We've had the references to the fire hose being, being turned on Stanley as well. Um, so fire again is representing, it seems to me, the, the reality of, of New Orleans. It, it's both the harshness of New Orleans and the masculinity of New Orleans, perhaps linked to World War II with the imagery of fire and, and, and bombs. Um, but, it, but it's also, I think, reality, you know, the, the, the fire is, is the real world intruding on Blanche um, and it's, you know, sort of surrounding her um, as much as she, she tries to, to stay clean. Uh, we get at the end of the scene, Blanche staggers back from the window and falls to her knees. The distant piano uh, is slow and blue. So even though uh, Blanche, uh, Mitch has left, Blanche is, you know, left on her knees. She's literally lower at the end of this scene and that very much sets up, I think, the scene 11.